Welcome to the Pretty Powerful Podcast, where powerful women are interviewed every week to share real inspiring stories and incredible insight to help women or anyone break the barriers, be a part of innovation, shatter the glass ceiling, and dominate to the top of their sport, industry, or life's mission. Join us as we celebrate exceptional women and step into our power. And now, here's your host, Angela Gennari. Hello, and thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pretty Powerful Podcast. My name is Angela Gennari, and today I'm here with Nicole Langevin. Hi, Nicole. Hello. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. My pleasure. So Nicole Langevin is one of North America's most notable leaders in the gymnastics industry. She speaks at regional and national conventions in the U.S., Canada, and is a top-rated judge, Olympic choreographer, and podcast host who is also active in the Special Olympics community. Very cool. How exciting is this? Not so, quite an elevator pitch. But- <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> what, uh, what, tell me what, what, um, Piqued your interest in gymnastics. How long have you been involved with gymnastics? I since I destroyed the furniture and flipped off the couch <laughs> I was about four or five years old, and my mom found the closest gym and said, "Take her, please." <laughs> I love that. So, so I I did gymnastics when I was little, but um, I quickly realized that I was getting too tall for it because I feel like I just kept hitting my head on everything. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of sprouted up really quickly when I was a kid. So that's, that's yeah. definitely hard in our sport. It doesn't, ultimately it really doesn't matter about, you know, body type or composition. It's, you know, how strong and coordinated are you in relation to that? Yeah. But I will say it, it's the, the rate of growth is definitely hard. I mean, some of the world's best gymnasts in the world. Yeah. We learn how to just swing on bars, even at their highest level when they had like a two inch growth spurt. Oh, so, wow. Well, it's all, yeah. it's all timing. So yeah, it, yeah. It, yeah, make it difficult. So when you were younger um, and you started getting into gymnastics, did you have like a particular part of gymnastics that you were most involved with? Like, uh, um, so there's parallel. different types of gymnastics. There's artistic gymnastics, which I think probably most of the listeners think of when they hear gymnastics. That's what Simone Biles does. It's the most popular. Uh. Gymnastics. And then there's rhythmic gymnastics where they use the ribbon and the hoops and the ball and all that stuff. Um, then there's also, I, I should know this better, but some of them are like newer versions of things that have existed. So there's, there's trampoline and tumbling now. There's, um, as group gymnastics and huh. at- partner acro and yeah I'm I'm not doing it justice but it's a lot under the umbrella of gymnastics these days so but I personally work in the world of artistic gymnastics which is vault bars beam and floor okay very cool and that's what I'm most familiar with too so we you know for a while we were doing security for University of Georgia and gymnastics was actually their biggest sellout sport oh that's huge yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it was crazy because, you know, UGA has this, everybody knows it as a football school, you know, this huge football, but gymnastics every time was a sellout. And it was just extraordinary to watch the athleticism. Um, I mean, just the core and the power and just, it was an amazing sport to watch. Yeah, that that is a dynasty. And I've had the the head coach, Suzanne Yockelin, who was, I don't know what year you were working with them, but yeah. She was she was the powerhouse coach, mm. working with us, unbeatable forever. Um, I've had her on my show, and she was probably one of my most interesting guests. And uh, and then two of the guests who have been on have also now just taken over the co head coach positions of Georgia. So ah, very cool. What's going on lately? Yeah, yeah. So we were with we were there 2019 through 2023. Oh, okay. So it's Courtney Coupets Carter. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, just an outstanding team and just the the coordination and the the strength. That's that's what was like most evident to me is the strength and the power. Yeah. But, and the funny thing is a lot of those athletes what they're doing that you're seeing now is actually watered down versions of what they are capable of. Really? Yeah. Wow, that's that's really crazy because these these people are athletes, like yeah. the truest definition. That's awesome. Yeah. So so why do you think they're watering it down? Is it just injury? Uh no, a lot of it is just based on what the rules are. So mm-hmm. many of the gymnasts at these top tier NCAA teams, Alabama, Utah, Georgia, mm-hmm. uh now Cal, 
UCLA. Um, there are more, but a lot of them actually already competed at the elite level, which is where you select the Olympic team from. So uh -huh. something like four percent of all gymnasts will ever even reach that level, never mind be put on a national team or a world team or Olympic team. So they're doing that and then going to college and they're able to actually back down a little bit on the difficulty of what they were doing. And that's why they're so consistent. Is wow. Yeah, they they truly are masters of what they're doing. Wow, that's really fascinating. So, how what are what are the you said four percent make it to the level of like just being able to compete at that level? So, what what does that com kind of commitment look like? Um, it's it's very different now than it was. Yeah, I'd say you know back in the nineties. Yeah, uh, it, it used to be very much this mentality of you know just get there as fast and hard as you can. And so these gymnasts were being pushed at a very, very young age, as soon as they showed talent to, to get to that top level. And so there, it was almost like people just believed you had, you can't go to school. If you're going to do that, you got to be homeschooled. You got to do wow. practices a day. And then we're talking about 10 year olds. Wow. So, That's um, crazy. Yeah. And the Olympic age, the minimum Olympic age used to be 14. Mm -hmm. So for some reason, coaches, and a lot of times it comes down to ego with coaches, I'm just going to be real. Mm -hmm. uh, they would hear that 14 as the minimum age as well, then that's the age that they have to get them to that level at. So they'd push so hard. And a lot of the kids would wouldn't make it. It's, it's too much on a young body and a young brain and emotionally and everything. Um, and then they moved the age to 16. And you could oh, kind wow. of be a little bit of pulling back on let's worry let's actually worry about longevity and you know creating humans that can function happily and successfully in the world yeah and yeah to, to look good um and now you know people like chelsea memo and simone biles and mm -hmm. they're all showing you can do and um Oh my gosh, Oksana Chusevitna, who is late 40s at this point, doing gymnastics at a high level and succeeding. So now the story's really changed. It is yeah. not so much about you can't have anything else but this. There's a lot more balance, a lot more focus on athlete wellness. Mm. Even the National Team Training Center has vastly changed from this closed door, behind closed doors thing. And now they're actually incorporating nutritionists and injury prevention and you know, the things that you probably should have for the highest level athletes in the world. Well, and those are the things that they have for other athletes, you know, yeah. for football teams and basketball teams. So it makes sense that they would incorporate. I mean, because I mean, it is just so hard on your body and you, your body is your it is your your, you know, what you do to create you know, the sport, the environment. I mean, it's not like you, you, you're a race car driver and it's all depending on the car and the driver. I mean, this is all you, right? So you have to keep your body in tip top shape. And that includes nutrition, not just skills, you know, not just skill set, but nutrition and constantly recuperating and, and making sure that your body is in recovery proper, mm -hmm. uh, proper amount versus not just, you know, get out there and perfect your skills. Mm -hmm. So that's fascinating. So um, I remember one of the games that, or one of the, the meets at Georgia, they had a, uh, there was an Olympic athlete. Was it Simone Biles? Uh, but they, one of the uh, Olympic athletes came and uh, when she was still competing um, in the SEC and it was insane because she had her own security team, like legit security team. And there's, there's more now than there ever was uh, going from, I'm, Jade Carey, Sunisa Lee, they're just Jordan Childs mm -hmm. uh, so does not do NCAA, but these athletes that, yeah, literally Grace McCallum, they go to the Olympics and then they're, they're right there competing in college. And it's like, yeah. It's incredible. yeah. Well, and you know, I, I own a security company and so we provide security and we, we had to, uh, you know, interact and make sure that their security team was, um, was meshing with ours. And so, that, right. you know, we weren't getting in each other's way. So it was just fascinating. But so you took your gymnastics career and then you pivoted into starting a business. Mm -hmm. So how did that, um, how did have being an athlete for so long, how did that help you when you were starting your business and tell me about your businesses? Um, so I remember being in fifth grade. Yeah. And uh, I remember my teacher, I, I didn't, I wasn't paying attention or I, I was doing a project. I just wasn't really, you know, putting much effort or care into it. And she said, you know, 
what are you what are you going to do when you you know these these grades follow you and with your career and this and that and I said well, I'm doing gymnastics yeah <laughs> said, well, it hurt and I remember looking at her and I was like I didn't necessarily mean that I was always going to be a gymnast I was just going to do gymnastics like I was going mm. I had no idea what that meant and at the time the only thing I ever knew about was people doing gymnastics or coaching gymnastics uh-huh but there was just this thing. And I think it's very similar. I don't want to compare myself to superstars, but like these actors who are just like, I knew as a young kid, right. I'm going to be on Broadway. I'm going to, you know, and it's like this obsession and this really like no questions asked, asked non-negotiable. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just, yeah, I looked at her and I was like, I'm, I'm doing gymnastics. And she said, what if you get hurt? And I said, do, I'm still doing gymnastics. So um, I went into coaching as soon as I was done uh -huh. and learned a lot there. And then I moved out to California where I was going to film school. I still found a gym to coach gymnastics at. Uh, it was supposed to just be part-time. And I was developing, trying to develop my choreography skills in and outside of gymnastics. And uh, fast forward a few years, I ended up taking over the whole Junior Olympic program there. So really just dug in and, and understood the ins and outs of developing athletes, dealing with parents, coming up with different systems, what works, what doesn't, just from the business standpoint as well. Um, and then just had this real itching sensation that I needed to get out of those four walls, not because there was anything wrong with it. And I, I loved the athletes that I worked with dearly. It was very heartbreaking to walk away. But there was just this pull of like, okay, you you did that. Yeah. There's there's other people to reach. There's other places to step into. And so I wanted to be able to impact outside, again, outside of those four walls. And the first way I was able to do that was with choreography. Uh, the, the athletes that I was coaching were doing very well, but they were definitely noted for their choreography and performance. So I was having a lot of gyms asking me to come in and, and work on that aspect with their athletes. And then I was like, well, I should probably put a name to this. So I put a name to it and uh, and just made that like the the second, I don't want to say second part of my job, but, you know, kind of moonlighting mm -hmm. all over doing this choreography thing. And then it was just a series of saying yes. Um, I remember I went into a gym in Pennsylvania. I did choreography. There was an athlete on beam which was one of the strongest areas that I, uh, that I excel in coaching wise. And I gave some advice to the coach. It was really good. And they said, well, do you, do you do clinics on beam? And at that time, that wasn't a phrase that I had heard of. That wasn't a, a role that I knew that people had. Yeah. I'm very much like I, I talk the talk and then I figure out how to walk later. So yeah, I love that. I, I've got a series of seven <laughs> I can do and then I got on the plane. I was like, Oh God, I better come up with these. Uh -huh. um, and then I, yeah, just started building that. So I would go into gyms and do clinics as well as choreography. And then, uh, and then it turned into, okay, I'm really liking this. I yeah. want to have more people. And so um, I was able to break into the lecture circuit, which is essentially for USA, they, USA Gymnastics splits up the country into eight regions. Uh-huh. Every region has its educational conference every year. It's like a big convention, you know, convention center type deal. And they have speakers on different tracks throughout the day. So I was able to get myself into those regional ones and then the national ones. And then I started getting invited to speak in Canada. And so it just kind of a lot of saying yes and then figuring it out type stuff. Uh, and then during all of that, you know, was like, well, I should probably judge too. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're. I think especially with a sport, you know, any athlete that's that excels at the highest level of their sport usually eats, sleeps and breathes it. Yeah. And, you know, even I I was I took my son to an archery lesson. Okay. And I was really into science. And so he was he was pretty good at it, and the guy was talking to him about uh technique or something and I looked at my son and I said, "Bon, it's like, you know, it's physics. That's what you've been learning about." And his eyes lit up and the guy said, you know what? The people that are really good at archery are constantly mapping out equations and angles and this and that. And it just reminded me of that. You know, you don't just do a sport. You like you encompass all of it. You want to know the history of it, the science behind it. Yeah, that's kind of I think, been my whole thing is I, I don't accept not understanding an aspect of my sport. And I don't say claim to say I understand every aspect of it or that I'm an expert in every aspect of it, but that's what I'm trying to do every day. There's yeah. some 
want to know everything about it. I want to be able to, you know, help people in any realm of the sport possible, whether it's mental, physical, emotional, technical, you know. Mm-hmm. I, well, so, and that's amazing because I mean, honestly, it just gives you a more well-rounded approach and you're better better at problem solving if you really truly understand the depth. You know, it's one thing to know a little bit about everything, but you can't problem solve that way. You know, you can only, you know, you problem solve by going deep. And so by doing what you're doing as far as, you know, really diving deep into the subject matter, whether it's, you know, the nutrition or, uh, you know, the history, the dynamics, the science behind it, that's really what's giving you that ability to do so much. And that's why, you know, you keep getting all these opportunities because, you know, you, you're an expert in the field. That's amazing. Thank you. So the business I have is, well, we're, we're rebranding a little bit, but it started out as precision choreography, okay. which was Nicole choreographing floor routines. That's all it was. Yes. And it turned into, okay, we're doing clinics and then, and now we're doing training camps and we're doing mastermind courses and we're doing coaches education and staff training, so many things. Uh, but the company started as precision choreography and that's kind of what it's known for, but it's now it's like so much more than that. Um, the, awesome. judging, the judging aspect of it as well. So we are rebranding it into precision gymnastics services so that mm. you know, we don't feel so pigeonholed, but mm-hmm. the heart and soul of it all, um, it really, that was the first passion was trying to understand, you know, what, what really makes an artist, what makes something beautiful to watch. Mm-hmm. I love that. So, so when you're learning choreography, where do you go to learn it? And is it specific to gymnastics or can you learn that choreography in other places and then bring it into gymnastics? Yeah, the idea is that, you know, gymnastics has a bad rep for for not being very artistic. And some of it is just because, especially at those highest levels, these girls are doing four tumbling passes. Yeah. A couple leap passes. Like, they're doing so much that there's so little time to breathe and dance. But it is absolutely possible. And, uh, but the kind of, I don't know, I guess the general stereotype is that gymnasts are kind of very stiff and they just pose 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 and so it's you know it's nice to try to pull give them the exposure to things outside of their sport not what they see on tv and go oh i guess that's what a floor routine looks like but Mm -hmm. younger age exposing them to different types of movements so that they can evolve as artists as well as athletes at the same time so i i talk to coaches a lot about the fact that you know we we wait until they're about 11, 10, 11, 12 to start talking about artistry because that's typically the level where they start having the opportunity to have their own choreography. Mm. Until then, the federation just goes, here are the routines that everybody has to learn. So mm-hmm. it doesn't matter what state you're in. If you're in a level four, you have the you have the same music and the same choreography as every other level four in the country. And those routines are, you know, they're fine. They're not breathtaking or anything right 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 they're very precise so a lot of coaches will just kind of wait on the artistry thing and then they these girls are 10 11 12 years old and now they're asking them at the most they're the most self-conscious part of their entire lives yeah yeah seriously (laughs) it's when they start looking sideways in the mirror this Mm -hmm. is when they start worrying about if they look cool or not and is this what i'm supposed to be doing and is that this what everybody else is doing and that's where we're going to ask them to start doing something vulnerable like performing and expressing themselves like yeah the window (laughs) i i just feel really passionate you got to start when they're little they don't care weird is fun yeah great and then you can kind of hone it by the time that they're actually needing to really use it yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. So when you're starting your business, when you're coming from, you know, um, a sports, you know, where you've put a sport where you've put so much passion and so much drive into that, was it hard to figure out how to put the pieces of the business together? Or did you have somebody helping out with that? Or did you study that? That's that's something I always look back. I'm like, man, I wish, you know, I, I go on a lot of instincts. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm from an entrepreneurial family, but no, I'm I did not get a business degree. I wish I did. That's probably my biggest regret because so much was based on on passion and determination. And you know, the business model is still evolving all the time. But the yeah. one thing that I never let go of was this is the thing. Yeah, yeah. As many pivots had to happen along the way, you know, um, but it's, uh, 
you know, there's no blueprint for exactly how to do something that does isn't already out there. And that's mm-hmm. the thing, too. you know, in our sport, it's it's there's a lot more now of people doing things like this, these kind of auxiliary type things in gymnastics. But, you know, growing up, there was no one to look at and go, oh, I want to do that. It was mm-hmm. You knew somebody that did, your coach knew somebody that did choreography, so they came in. There wasn't a choreography business or agency that you would call and submit your request. None of that existed. Uh, there was people owning gyms and people coaching at gyms. Mm, yeah. yeah. You learn about that, but there really wasn't a pathway to follow. So I'm kind of just like knocking things down and trying to figure it out as we go. But one of the, one of the things that made a big difference was... Um, I it was just me for a while, and then there was a gymnast who I really, really admired, Alicia Sacramoni. She's from Massachusetts, which is where I'm from, uh-huh. and she was just, I mean, world champion on floor and vault. She's a, she's a powerhouse, but she's also a great performer, and uh, she's also not your stereotypical just like smile and nod gymnast like we were seeing at the time. She yeah. had a, like, a little more. Um, they used to call her the honey badger. So, <laughs> I love it. So I just remember watching her. I'm like, I feel like we would get along. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I saw her one day after she had retired the first time after the 08 Olympics. And I just, I just went up to her and, and I think it was living in LA. I just had this kind of like, here's my card. Let's do a thing. Uh-huh. So I just went up to her and was like, Hey, I, I know you're retired now and I just, I really think there's some great stuff we can do together. I love to talk about if you want to go to lunch sometime sidebar, she was also living in LA at the time. I didn't ah, okay. Um, so we went to lunch. It lasted two hours. We laughed. Wow. We, yeah. We connected. And then I brought her on kind of like a little East coast tour of doing choreography at different places mm-hmm. and getting somebody at that caliber to believe in what I was doing and then also be a part of what I was doing definitely elevated the business and what I was trying to do it got a lot more notoriety uh and and like I guess legitimized this weird idea that I had mm-hmm. and yeah she's we still we still do stuff together um she's actually one third of running the entire country's gymnastic system right now so wow. she's busy. a little but, busy <laughs> but just like realizing that these these people that you see on tv or and that you admire like she was still a 21 year old that she didn't just graduate college but she graduated gymnastics Mm -hmm. she served her country in the olympics it's like coming out of the military i feel you put everything you have into it and then you get out and it's like what do i do you know but from the outside you're like well that's alicia sacrimony no she's a 21 year old girl looking for her way and you know Um, a lot of that throughout the years of just approaching kind of these high profile people, but having the confidence enough to go, okay, if they, if they bite, yeah, 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 I can show them some really great stuff. And that's, that's the thing too. Like, I know I joked about walking the walk or talking the talk and then figuring out how to walk. But at a certain point, you know, when you, you have that confidence to go, man, if somebody could just see what I'm doing, I know I'd be successful. Yeah. Then start tapping shoulders and go, Hey, look what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and you never know, like I always say, you don't know if you don't try. So if you, if you were too, you know, afraid or intimidated to go up and just, just have the conversation, you never know where it could lead. So just having the courage to go up to her was this huge, I mean, you just never know, look where it took you. So then you were able to watch your, your choreography in the Olympics. That was pretty cool. I bet. That was cool. Yeah. So So, what led to that? So there is a incredible, incredible woman named Huri Gabishian. And she, um, she actually was a way younger teammate of mine. So she was just coming up when I was coming out. Okay. I was a level 10 at the time. There was a, there was a few of us and we were, you know, we were like the big shots of the gym doing all this hard stuff. And all of a sudden I turn around, there's this teeny tiny 10 year old. Uh-huh. Doing and I'm like, who is this kid? And, and she was strong and she was, uh, she was like positive and she worked hard. I'm like, this kid is going places. And then I moved across the country and kind of didn't really follow. Uh, she turned out to compete in college and then uh, make a run for competing for her 
her uh it's her home country but she's got dual citizenship at least um with armenia and they didn't have any gymnasts at all oh wow national team or for vying for the olympics or anything like that very very different setup and she tried for two quads which is eight years so two rounds of the olympics she coached herself she put together her own program all the while being a uh, labor and delivery nurse wow yeah and i apologize cool. for if she was a uh, practitioner nurse practitioner but i i just view them all as incredible so yeah yeah, um, yeah she she was working for full time in a hospital wow. and showing herself again, you know, kind of similar, like doing something that's not something that people do. Right. And uh in she she did it in uh for Rio. She qualified herself to Rio and she had been following what I was doing and I was following what she was doing, but we weren't really talking to each other. And I ran into her in Boston and she said, um, you know, I made it and or I I'm she was, I think, Olympic trials or or I, she used world championships to to qualify, whatever it was. She had her her final hope of trying to make this happen. And she's like, I can't think of anybody else that I'd want to do my choreography, not only just because she liked what I did, but also just that connection of this being like a very yeah. family type feeling. So, yeah, that that got out there. We worked our tails off and um, her videos are on YouTube and her performance at the Rio Olympics is one of the most joyous things you'll ever watch because oh. she went out there as the first gymnast representing Armenia at an Olympic Games. Wow. Um, she she actually, after every event, went over and kissed the equipment. Wow. I've never seen that joy <laughs> from the athlete on that stage before. Like you could just tell it wasn't the traditional way and I, she wasn't supposed to be there really mm -hmm. in like, traditional sense. You, it's not a thing that happens. So yeah, that was, that was really rewarding. That is super cool. I love that story. That's really neat because you just never know. I mean, tenacity can get you way more places than you could ever imagine. So good for her. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So where is she now? She is in Ohio. She's working in a hospital oh nice good for she her a lot of motivational speaking obviously yeah, yeah yeah for sure very cool so in the time that you've been in LA you did some of the LA things with Hollywood so tell me what that was like working in Hollywood um it seems like another world away now because I'm really <laughs> again it's just like really I did that um, that's awesome but yeah I think you definitely help to just be around things that are visions that are coming to life all the time mm. everywhere you look like a screenplay is being made a deal is being made a show's be a pilot's being shot an actor's audition like things like creative things were just it wasn't a dream it's like they're literally happening in front of your face all the time so i think that just really fit well with my kind of never satisfied like always got to make something happen thing that i'm trying yeah. to chill out on a little bit because it's exhausting <laughs> but um it was but it was also you know just eye-opening to go no I don't I don't need to slow down too much like you can make things happen it is possible and so you know I definitely um carry that back home a lot yeah. uh, just having having an idea for something and then going it, it can be done yeah absolutely yeah wow. um but yeah I did like uh <laughs> definitely a lot of talking the talk and then walking the walk yeah <laughs> I got myself in a choreographing opening numbers for fashion shows with members of the blue man group like wow so, that was all confidence and then like <laughs> oh, you know what let me figure this out uh, <laughs> yeah I talked myself into a lot of things but like in my gut was like no you are going to figure this out you mm -hmm. got 24 hours to figure it out that's amazing because my my business philosophy and when people are saying you know people always ask like how did you get where you got and like how did you do it and I'm like my business philosophy is say yes and figure it out so there were yeah. so many things through the years where I'm like I would get off the phone after saying yes to somebody and I'm like shit what did I just do <laughs> I'm like yeah. it looks like I won't be sleeping for the next few days while I figure out how to but navigate also, this you know deep in your heart like yeah 
the ability to figure it out. Right, right. Well, that's the thing. Like, you know, everything is figure outable. And so like, I'm a big believer in the answer is there. We just got to uncover it. That's it. And so it's like, and I also am one of those people who I have the audacity to think that if somebody else is doing it, I can do it too. And so- <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> <laughs> I'll watch I'll watch an electrician put up a ceiling fan I was like done I'm so doing that the next time and then I'll install the next ceiling fan and I'll stumble my way through it and half the time the switches don't work but I'm like it's okay it's opposite just learn the opposites and it'll be fine <laughs> so, it'll eventually work <laughs> but yeah so um so who inspires you um I have, every time I ask that question, I'm like, I feel like I'm supposed to say somebody famous that people know, no. um, which I'm sure if I gave it a little more thought, it would come up, or if we were talking, it would just naturally come up. Um, but I will say there was a, a coach in my life um, who is no longer with us, who was kind of like a grandfather figure growing uh when I was like 14 to to 18 and okay. then even in my 20s we we stayed connected he's very much a me like a life mentor and uh he was so accomplished hmm. books this man wrote and the people this man inspired and the the breakthroughs that he made the I mean, it, it blows my mind because I don't think I'll ever be able to write it all down, the bullet list of things that he did. And I'll remember something one day. I'm like, oh my God, he did that too. Yeah. Um, so being a part of a, a, a court hearing that changed the direction literally of gymnastics in our country. But then also like he held Jimi Hendrix's blanket on the side of the stage at Woodstock. Like, wow. Wow. <laughs> That's Expert awesome. Psychologist, school psychologist, just everything. And with the superior knowledge and ability that he had, you would never, if you just wouldn't know, just so humble, um, so kind. So if he, if you sat down with him and you never met him and you had no idea what he did, you wouldn't because he, all he'd be doing is asking about you and supporting you. Wow. And make important person and I think about that so much where you know people can say or do say and I tell my kids this like if you're good at something you don't have to brag about it you just you just are right. but it's really hard when you're trying to accomplish something to, you, you want people to know right yeah. like and yeah. get to that point of mastering I almost feel like mastering life to be that chill about it and just let things come out as they may and and um, I really, really admire that. It seems like such a peaceful place to be. And and just having that ability to make everybody that comes around you feel like the most important person in the room. It's something I, I, I hope to try to be able to do. That's really cool. I love that. So um, a lot of times as women, we give our power away. And so this is something I always bring up on our podcast is, you know, it's called the Pretty Powerful Podcast and we interview very powerful women. But at some points, you know, we typically will give our power away. And I know in gymnastics, there's been a ton of controversy with like, you know, the potential sexual abuse and like how women are yeah, treated. Women. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, and, and like how women are treated. And so can you tell me about any time and, and, you know, don't have to be specific, but um, that you've given your power away, whether somebody else got credit for your work or somebody else, you know, was able to criticize you and you didn't stand up for yourself. You know, can you tell me about a time that you gave your power away and then another time where you stepped into your power? Um, I mean, I definitely gave my power away, not necessarily to the opposite sex. Yeah. But to some, to well, multiple times, people who I viewed as more worthy or more powerful than me. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. And so that's been something I've been working on a lot the last few years is, you know, I told you that story about Alicia, right? Yeah. And yeah. so for me, it was like, I'm this nobody, even though I'm doing all the stuff back here, I like she brought some spotlight into what I was doing. But at this point, I, I'm really struggling and, and people tell me that I'm crazy to say this, but like, I still kind of feel that like, yeah, that 
that who am I to whatever I need something else attached to me to be like, look, and I've, I've had a lot of people, I'm um, and Alicia and I have a wonderful relationship. So I'm not talking about her. Um, Chelsea Memel as well, like just still such a wonderful relationship, but there mm -hmm. were a few others in the past where I just, I kind of let them take the credit for the work I was doing behind the scenes. Yeah. But yeah. like people would be more satisfied with that result than knowing that I was actually doing the work and they are just along for the ride. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, and I think that happens a lot in, in situations where you're young, you know, like if you're in the corporate world and you're young and, you know, you just kind of assume other people will continue to get credit. And so it's harder to rise when you're doing that, right? Because you're not giving yourself the credit that you deserve. And, uh, and so you, it's that imposter syndrome, I think that people oh. deal with all the time. So, yeah. well, and it's interesting. There's, there's even a, um, there's a CEO of a multi-billion dollar company. And one of the, one of the ways that I was able to get over imposter syndrome is, um, you know, he was talking about imposter syndrome and how it affected, you know, like um, the editor of Entrepreneur Magazine was like, yeah, you know, I'm having imposter syndrome because I just took over this. I'm, I'm interviewing all these like powerful CEOs and I'm wondering like, what am I doing here? And the CEO goes, I struggle with imposter syndrome. Yeah. He is the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, like, it doesn't even matter what level you're at, you're dealing with it. It's just, but it's interesting. Sometimes it's like stepping back and you, you had mentioned something about, you know, your younger self, you know, what would yeah. you say? And I think some of that is like you, you kind of like revert back and step aside and go and look at what you're doing from that standpoint. And that's mm. when it happens for me, I last, uh, within the last couple of years, I started working with the Switzerland national team and I got brought out there to do a training camp with the junior national team. This is, yeah. uh, this is my why right here. This oh, is hello. <laughs> Right. Um, I'll, I'll introduce you in a second. Okay. Oh, okay. 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 But, um, yeah, I remember on that, on that plane ride, it was like, what they are going to be so disappointed, like, yeah. you know, and then you go in and just do what you do. And it's like, oh yeah. 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 I'm on here. I'm making a difference. I know what I'm talking about. Okay. That's right. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and with your level of understanding and depth and passion with the industry, I would have a hard time believing anyone could doubt you. But um, so what advice would you give to your 18 year old self? Um to uh don't don't second guess walk talk in the talk and then walk in the walk. Mm hmm It's the that is uh that it works. It my does work. Favorite but that that is what's going to work for me and that I'll know when to say no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, yeah, just realizing that you are enough and not needing to have somebody else, you know, share that spotlight that you can just have the spotlight on yourself. And it's not in a sense of like, trust me, I'm not shy. I'm the First one on the karaoke mic, the, you know, like I have no issues with, uh, you know, feeling like I can't have the spotlight in the, in the performance sense, mm -hmm. but I think in the accomplishing sense, you know, just that yeah. like, I, I can be a legitimate figure on my own. And, yeah. and you are. Yeah, absolutely. So what obstacles have, what's the biggest obstacle you've had to overcome in terms of like, you know, either getting to the peak of your gymnastics career, getting to, you know, you run three businesses and you have two children. I mean, this is, you are doing so much and you're working at such a high elite level with such high elite athletes. The pressure must be intense, but what obstacles, um, what, what would you say your biggest obstacles have, have been? Um, but not knowing when to to stop something i actually just kind of started figuring it out yeah uh, the three businesses that you mentioned have now melded into one good um yeah. i i would yeah i was sharing too much um but the other thing is like so the podcast that i i have a podcast called what makes you think and it's interviewing high level figures in gymnastics whether they're yeah. or world team coaches or what, anything like that. And I was doing it because somebody that does marketing said, you have the personality, you have the connections, you know what you're talking about, you should do it. So I did it. Yeah. And it, as you know, 
and I don't know if what support you have with post and all of that, but I was doing all of it on my own. The, the scheduling of the guests, the research for the guests, the actual interviews, and then trying to acquire sponsors and putting together mm -hmm. the ads. It was a hundred hours for every 50 minute episode. It was just so much, but it, it was that thing of like, but I said, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it. I'm really going to do it. Yeah. And it got to, I just had this huge realization kind of recently of, you know what? I think the show did what it was going to do. It elevated where I am and what I'm doing. It built a lot of connections. It entertained a lot of people and, and a lot of really interesting and important conversations. Um, I actually had Judge Aquilina on, Judge Rosemary Aquilina, who was the the former doctor um tried that case you know wow. so really yeah she was on twice actually and now I was starting to feel like I'm like digging to try, well who can I get on next and then I just had to realize I don't think I need to keep doing this I think I did it and maybe there'll be an opportunity to come do a special episode here here and there but nobody ever said you have to do this every single week in and out yeah yeah nobody ever said you have to take time away from your kids to yeah. edit 60 second promo reel you mm -hmm. that was self-imposed yeah so <laughs> it's done possibly and now now what else you know so once things start feeling forced and unjustified you know the dollars aren't rolling in from it yeah yeah it's Absolutely. not easy. It's not fruitful. Um, then it's okay to go, okay, I did that thing. And yeah. That's, yeah. that's not failure. That's like just being done. Yeah. And I think that is my biggest obstacle is just holding on to things for way longer because I thought stopping things is failing at them. Like you just, oh, gosh, and yeah, it's not true. Yeah, that's brilliant because you're right. I mean, I think that's also the overachiever mentality, right? Like you want to do it, but you want to be the best at it and you're going to keep going because you're not a quitter. And, but yes. you're right. I mean, there's, you know, I, I put so much pressure on myself and like my to-do list will start with, you know, 17 things by the end of the day, I've crossed out one and I've added seven. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so it's like this, but it's the pressure on myself and half of the things that are on my to-do list aren't even things I'm doing for other people. It's pressure and added things that I've added to my plate that nobody, else, it, they don't even know about it. And so it just pressure, pressure, pressure. And so, yeah, I can, I can hundred percent relate to that. Mm -hmm. And you're right. I mean, I started my podcast and, you know, I still have my full-time job. And when I first started it, I wasn't quite as busy. And, you know, now we've expanded into six more states and, you know, we've taken on all these other, you know, more management and the management is like, you know, it's not like it, it doesn't lessen the amount of work that you have. It adds to it <laughs> because you just have more people to manage, but, um, so yeah, that's been the struggle is, okay, at what point do I just say enough is enough? Uh, you know, I'm not, I ha I can't be accountable to everybody for everything, you know, and still be accountable yeah. to myself. So balance. Yeah. So I really enjoyed this podcast. Thank you so much, Nicole. But what, what is the, the last question I have is what do you wish more people know? Or what do you wish more people knew? Um, just in general about anything about anything because we my daughter is sitting down here as, as um one thing that that comes up in our house all the time and that I really wish that people truly truly believed and didn't just say is that Rosanna when people are mean they're really what sad. they're really sad uh-huh yeah. um, and it, it goes along with that whole, like, you don't know what anybody else is going through. You don't know what their story is. Don't judge. But the other side of that, too, is can you really, truly believe that? And yeah. I really, really do. If somebody's being mean, you feel bad. Don't I feel know. hurt by them. Feel that they have hurt. And I think that would really change the way that we deal with each other. Yeah. Not always ah, yeah, I love that. Um, and you're right because I, you know, when, when I've dealt with, you know, things in the past, you know, and I have a son too, and when bullying has come, come up, I've always said like, honey, hurt people, hurt people. And what? so, you know, be so grateful that you don't know what's going on in their house. 
And so, you know, you get to come home to a family who loves you and, you know, uh, a bed you can sleep in at night and you have no idea what's going on in the four walls of their house. So just know that hurt people hurt people. And, you know, you could not be more right about that. Yeah. So, well, thank you so much, Nicole. I've really enjoyed our conversation. You have been very inspiring. And um, I just love that you're continuing to live your passion um, for gymnastics and influencing so many others. So congratulations on all your success. Thank you. And how can people find you? So uh, you can find me and Dr. Shira Lewis, who is my new partner with Precision, which is very exciting. Nice. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and whatever they're doing with Twitter uh, uh -huh. <laughs> at, at Precision Choreo. The website is precisionchoreo.com. And then I do stuff with um, anything that's related to the podcast content that we've done, things that are more my personal lane, um, professionally and personally. It is Nicole Langevin Consultant on Facebook and Instagram. Very cool. And if you're looking for the spelling of her, of her name, it's a J and not a G. No, it's, well, it's a, a G, but so it's a G, not a J. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was like, I know I'm going to mess this up. But um, yes, yeah, so you can also find her on prettypowerfulpodcast.com. We will make sure all of her links are also on there. But thank you everyone for joining us for another episode of the Pretty Powerful Podcast. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great day. Thank you for joining our guests on the Pretty Powerful Podcast. And we hope you've gained new insight and learned from exceptional women. Remember to subscribe or check out this and all episodes on prettypowerfulpodcast.com. Visit us next time. And until then, step into your own power.